If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 34. Ezekiel 34. This will be our Old Testament reading. We'll read the first 16 verses here, and then we'll turn again to the Gospel of Mark, which we have been slowly working our way through to Mark chapter 6. So Ezekiel 34, starting at verse 1. Ezekiel 34, starting at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not the shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered, and because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey, and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd, because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths. That they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall, there, shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Now we turn to the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Those who are visiting, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Mark, passage by passage, and we come to chapter 6, and we'll read verses 30 to 44, which will be our text this evening. Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. 
And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages, and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. My brother-in-law, who is a pastor in northern British Columbia, recently preached a sermon that he entitled, An Army of Lambs. An Army of Lambs. Now that's a biblical title, but if you stop and you step back and you try to picture it in your mind, you realize very quickly that from a natural perspective, it's a ridiculous picture. An army is a picture of strength, of force, and of power. Whereas a lamb is the very epitome of weakness and helplessness. But of course you realize, don't you, that that's actually the very point of the title. Its very natural absurdity highlights for us one of the most fundamental lessons of Christian discipleship. And that is the deeply built conviction that it is when we are weak that we are strong. You see, at the heart of effective Christian service stands the realization of our complete dependence upon Christ. Now we recognize as Christians we are sent into this world as the soldiers of Christ. We are sent to set the captives free, to demolish spiritual strongholds. And yet we go as an army of lambs in the recognition that apart from our shepherd we have nothing we are nothing, and we can do nothing. This afternoon, we return to our study of Mark's Gospel, and we come to the feeding of the 5,000. Now, this is the only miracle outside the resurrection of Christ that is recorded in all four Gospel accounts. And that fact alone makes us realize that it has very deep significance in the revelation that it gives us of the identity and of the mission of Christ. However, in Mark's Gospel, it's very interesting that this revelation is placed very intentionally in the context of discipleship. We are in the middle of a section that is intentionally bringing into focus the preparation of the twelve disciples for the removal of Christ, for Christ to return to heaven. It's a section that will culminate when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ in chapter 8. Now, at the beginning of the chapter, Christ has just sent out his disciples on their first missionary circuit. He sent them out to preach and to have authority over unclean spirits. That is to say, we are at a point in the discipleship of the twelve apostles in which they have moved from being mere witnesses of Christ's ministry to becoming active participants in it. And it's against that background that we come to today's passage. You'll notice in verse 30... That the very background that initiates this passage is that the apostles return from their missionary circuit and they report to Christ what they have done and what they have taught. And it's in that context that we have Christ's well-known miracle. What that highlights for us is that in the midst of this awesome revelation of Christ is interwoven an incredibly important lesson of Christian ministry. And that is essentially the lesson of dependence. Now, as we approach this passage, then, we need to be mindful of these two things. We need to be mindful of the revelation that it gives us of Christ, but we also need to be mindful 
of the lesson it teaches us about discipleship. And so I want to look at this theme this afternoon, or this sermon, this, this text this afternoon under the theme, The Good Shepherd Feeding His Sheep in the Wilderness. The Good Shepherd Feeding His Sheep in the Wilderness. And there are three things this passage shows us about Christ. We see the shepherd he is, the bread he provides, and the disciples he trains. So first, let's look at the shepherd he is. The shepherd he is. So in verses 30 and 31, the apostles return to Christ after their preaching circuit. And they report to him what they've done and what they've taught. And Christ says to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. However, as we go on from there, what we find is that they get into the boat and they go across the sea. And when they arrive at their destination, a desolate place, they find that the crowd has run on foot and is meeting them there. And so instead of finding a secluded, solitary place to rest, a place where they can finally enjoy a meal in peace, a place where they can finally enjoy sweet, quiet fellowship with their Savior, with their Master, instead they run into a busy crowd that wants the attention of Christ. We read in verse 34. When Christ went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. We're going to come back to this, but we need to pause. I want you to think about this setting in connection with the miracle that will follow. Because you see, if we are to rightly understand this miracle, we need to realize it is rooted in the Old Testament. And there's two Old Testament images specifically that are noted in these introductory verses that are brought together in the feeding of the 5,000. The first is the image of a hungry crowd being miraculously fed in the wilderness. A hungry crowd miraculously fed. If you look at the text in verses 31, 32, and 35, we have the reference to a desolate place. They've gone to a desolate place. In the context of Mark, that word refers to the wilderness. And if you've been here throughout this series, you know that that was a place of significance for Christ. It was a place that Christ would withdraw to. It was the place of communion, the place of revelation. It was the place of testing. However, our minds also go back to the Old Testament. Just think of this picture in your mind. You have a great prophet raised up by God leading a great crowd of people into the wilderness, and on the way he miraculously feeds them with bread and with meat. You see, the imagery of the whole scene is meant to draw our minds and make us think very clearly of Moses. But of course you'll remember that Moses did not just give the people bread to eat, he also was the prophet who came down from the mountain of God and he brought to God's people the word of God and the covenant of God. And those are the very things that we see here in the Lord Jesus Christ. On the one hand, we have a crowd gathered in the wilderness, and Christ feeds them miraculously, but he also teaches them. He gives to them the word of God. That is to say, what we are being given a, a picture of is we are being given a picture of Christ as a new and a greater Moses. Here is the one who has come to lead his people in a new spiritual exodus. He's come to lead his people out of bondage to sin, through the wilderness of this world, to bring them to their heavenly promised land. However, there's a second Old Testament image, closely connected with that, that we see in this passage, and that's the image of a shepherd who feeds his sheep. A shepherd who feeds his sheep. We're told in verse 34 that Jesus looked out at the crowds and he had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Once again, that phrase has Old Testament illusions. In Numbers 27, Moses is about to die. The Lord says, okay, your time has come. You need to come up onto the mountain. You can view the promised land, but then you are going to die. And Moses responds with this prayer. Let the Lord appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord 
may not be as sheep that have no shepherd. Moses is saying, but Lord, there must be. There must be a divinely appointed leader. There must be someone to teach your people, to guide your people, because their hearts are so wayward. And so quickly, if they're not led, if they're not shepherded like sheep without a shepherd, they'll go astray, they'll be lost, they'll be defenseless. And of course, what we find, what we read in Ezekiel is in the prophets, this is the very thing that happened in the history of Israel. The shepherds, those who are called to shepherd God's people, instead of protecting, instead of providing for the, the people of God, they used their authority to take advantage. They fed themselves on the sheep rather than feeding the sheep themselves. And the result was that God's people were scattered. They became food for the wild beasts. They had no one to seek for them, no one to, to feed them. That is to say, spiritually, they were left defenseless before the pole of idolatry and before the oppression of the nations around them. In Ezekiel 34, as we read, God says, I myself, I am going to seek for my sheep. I'm going to rescue them, and I'm going to feed them. But there's one more Old Testament passage that our minds need to go to. In your text, you'll notice in verse 39, that Jesus commands the crowd to sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, Matthew and John both note that little detail. Now, certainly that tells us, okay, this is an eyewitness account on the one hand, but, but why this focus on this little detail? Well, think about the most well-known passage of a shepherd in the Old Testament. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down, where? Green pastures. So when we take all these images together, what we are getting is a clear picture of what is being revealed in Christ in the feeding of the 5,000. Christ is saying essentially, I am the answer to Moses' prayer. I am the greater Moses, the new prophet who has come to teach God's people and guide God's people. I am the one who has come to seek for my sheep and gather my sheep when they have been scattered and defenseless by the failure of human shepherds. And I am the Lord who has become man that I might be the shepherd of my people that they might never be in want. As we understand that context, that gives us a critical understanding for the miracle that will follow. Because it makes very clear to us that this was not merely a physical miracle meeting a merely physical need. It was pointing to a far deeper spiritual reality. It was pointing to the very essence of who Christ was and what he had come to do. And you just think, just just picture in your mind Christ in that desolate place as his compassion goes out to the crowd that he sees. And don't forget the state of God's people at that time. The religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, instead of teaching God's people the covenant of grace, instead of shepherding them in the, the steadfast love of the Lord, they had been heaping on God's people burdens that they could not bear. They had been feeding them with man-made religion of man-made rules and traditions and ceremonies. And the people had been left scattered on the hills, far from God. And this is what stirs Christ's compassion as he looks out and he sees them. And this is why his solution is to teach them. To teach them about the kingdom of God. To teach them about the grace and the salvation of God. My friends, we live in a spiritual wasteland in this world. We live in a world where spiritually men and women are wandering about aimless and defenseless. They're enslaved to their own sin and they're oppressed by the sin of others. And they are defenseless before the deceptions of Satan and before the seductions of this world. When we look around and we see the shepherds of false religion and they just heap up burdens upon people. They say, by your own blood, sweat, and tears, you need to earn your way into the presence of a holy God. Or they say, oh, God is love. Don't worry about sin. Let it dwell within you. 
Or you can think of the false shepherds of our secular humanistic society that says, you know what, freedom is found in defining yourself. Make up your own truth. Make up your own morality. Follow your heart to happiness. All of them are lies, and all of them are deceptions. And here stands the Lord Jesus Christ with a heart filled with compassion, and he stands before the world and he declares salvation of free grace, a revelation. He is the revelation of God, and he is full of grace, and he is full of truth. And he says, I will shepherd you. If you will believe in me, I will shepherd you along the path of righteousness to heaven. As we see in Ezekiel 34, he says, I'll seek the lost. I'll bring back the stray. I'll bind up the injured. And I'll strengthen the weak. My friends, I would plead with you. Do not listen to the lies of the world around you. This world cannot, in all of its voices, all of its promises, it cannot answer the deepest needs of your soul. It cannot meet those ultimate questions. It cannot show you how to deal with your sin and your guilt and your shame. It cannot bring you back to God. And so we see the shepherd that he is. The shepherd that he is. To get a fuller picture of that, we need to go on secondly to the bread he provides. The bread he provides. Verses 35 to 44, we read of this display of Christ's power, in which a crowd of 5,000 men, not including women and children, are miraculously fed. Now, we've been talking about the deeper spiritual significance, and we're going to talk more about that, but I don't want you to miss the glory of the physical miracle. I mean, Jesus tells the people to sit down, and then we read in verse 41. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Now, the text does not tell us how exactly the miracle took place. It actually is completely devoid of those details. We don't know if the bread was multiplying in the hands of the disciples, in the hands of Christ, or was he pulling in, taking out of a basket, and he just kept on going and it multiplied. We don't know. We're not told. But what is clear is that this was not a sleight of hand. This was not some magician's trick that just appeared to be supernatural. We have a crowd, a massive crowd, in a desolate place, and they all eat and are satisfied. It was all you can eat. They ate and were satisfied with 12 baskets left over. It's an awesome display of the supernatural power of Christ. But as we think about that miracle in the context of what we've already seen in the Old Testament background, we realize that something deeper was being revealed here than merely the supernatural power of Christ. Go back again to that image of Christ as the shepherd, the one who has come to gather and to feed his sheep. What we are seeing in the miracle that Christ performs here is we are being given a glimpse of how, how this shepherd will feed his sheep in the wilderness. In John chapter 6, the account of the miracle is followed by an extensive sermon by Christ, and Christ begins by exhorting the people, and he says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And he goes on to point to the spiritual reality that is pictured in the miracle. He says, The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now think about those words. Christ saying, I'm going to feed you. And if you believe in me, you'll never hunger, you'll never thirst. I'll satisfy the deepest parts of your soul. But think about that in the context of Christ breaking the bread. Christ is hinting at this, and we know this from the Lord's Supper. Christ is saying, in the wilderness of this world, I will feed my sheep. But here is how I will do it. 
I will do it by being broken for them. I will do it by my sacrifice upon the cross where my body will be broken, that it might become nourishment, spiritual nourishment for my people. He says in John 6, the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Feed upon me. I am the food that nourishes you unto eternal life. Nothing else in the spiritual wasteland of this world can spiritually sustain you. If you look elsewhere, you will starve. Christ says, look to me. By faith, look at my sacrifice. Look at my broken body upon the cross. Because by that look of faith, I will give you the grace to heal your soul, to nourish your soul, and to give you eternal life. And you see the abundance that he provides. Twelve baskets are left over. Christ is not a skimpy host. He doesn't give you just enough to take off the edge of hunger. No, he gives and he gives and he gives until you've had more than enough. He satisfies to the fullest. Again, Psalm 23. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And every Christian, every Christian, who is steadily walking with their eyes upon Christ can testify that this is true. That Christ satisfies to the fullest. Now that, that doesn't mean you don't experience sorrow or weariness or hardship. But it means that deep within, in the midst of all the trials, all the temptations of life, there is a well of living water welling up to eternal life. Deep within there is a sense of joy and peace because you know that you are accepted and beloved by God. There's a deep satisfaction of knowing that the life I'm living is the very purpose for which I was made. I'm living for the God of the universe who is satisfying my soul. The question is, my friends, are you feeding upon Christ? Have you partaken of the bread of life by faith? You see, it's not... And we need to be reminded of this. It's not abstract doctrine. It's not mere emotional experiences. And it's not just Christian morality set down as a list of rules to follow that will sustain us in the wilderness of this world. No, it's as these things, doctrine, experience, morality, it's as these things are rooted in Christ, as they're centered in Christ, as they flow from Christ. That's when they become nourishment to our souls. The life of faith, the life of the Christian, at its very essence, is a life of knowing Christ, loving Christ, feeding upon Christ. And that's not just how we begin the Christian life. That's, that's the sum and substance of how it's carried on. That's how it grows. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. My friends, have you eaten by faith of the bread of life? Have you found abundant life? Have you known satisfaction for your soul? This is what the Good Shepherd holds out. He laid down his life for the sheep that he might hold out himself to be our salvation and to be our life. And so we see the shepherd he is and we see the bread he provides. But finally, let us see the disciples he trains. The disciples he trains. Now, in a sense, what we've already looked at forms the very heart of what this miracle was teaching. It was a, a glorious revelation of Christ's person and his mission. However, as I said in the introduction, it is very significant that this is placed in the context of the return of the disciples from their circuit of ministry. Once again, just... Let your mind go back to that Old Testament background. Think about those prophetic passages that speak of God's people being scattered like sheep without a shepherd. Now, ultimately, Christ was the chief shepherd. We recognize that. However, Christ was also in the very process of preparing his disciples to become under shepherds. You see, Christ was going to go away. He was going to ascend to where he had come from. He was going to go back to his father. And the question was, when Christ is gone, how will the crowds feed? Who will bring them to the feet of the shepherd? Who will set before them the bread of life? And so Christ is also teaching a very significant 
truth to his apostles about the ministry that they would be called to. And we see here two essential lessons about their calling, and that's the same lessons that are incredibly important for us today as we engage in any form of Christian service. The first lesson was that the disciples needed to learn to reflect Christ's compassion for the flock. They needed to learn to reflect Christ's compassion for the flock. Now you can imagine the irritation of the disciples in verse 34, can't you? I mean, they're exhausted, they're weary, they arrive in a boat to a desolate place, and here comes the crowd running to meet them. They're exhausted from their ministry. They've been looking forward to some time alone with Christ. They've been looking forward to a meal in peace. And here comes the crowd again. I know that in my own life, I can confess freely to you, when I'm exhausted, I find it very hard to sympathize with the needs of others. If I've had a very long day and I'm feeling spent and weary and I'm settling down to read a book and relax or getting ready to go to bed and someone knocks on my door and phones me and say they need help, my first response is annoyance, not compassion. That's my natural fallen response. And very likely that was the case with the disciples here. But of course, it stood in contrast to the reaction of Christ. Christ is moved with compassion. And so the disciples have to sit there, and they have to wait, and they have to attend to the crowd, they have to organize the crowd, they have to attend to their master if he needs something, and they have to wait for their food, and they have to wait for their time with the master, and they just have to sit back and swallow their irritation and their disappointment. And it's in that context that we come to verse 35 and 36. We read, when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, in one sense, it's a very practical suggestion. But, of course, the apostles hadn't considered, or maybe they didn't want to consider, the fact that the small fishing villages in, around this desolate place would never have the kind of food to satisfy 5,000 men plus women and children. In any case, Christ responds to his disciples by saying, you give them something to eat. And there's emphasis in the Greek on you. You give them something to eat. Now, why did Christ say that? I think it was because he was teaching his disciples a spiritual lesson about compassion. All too often in the Gospel accounts, we find the disciples ready to send people away. Send the crowd away, Lord. Send the, send the Syrophoenician woman away because she's crying out after us. Send the little children away. Don't disturb the Master. And Christ is trying to teach them. He's saying, my disciples, no, you never send the crowd away from the shepherd. You never send them away from me. I'm preparing you to be under shepherds. And sending away hungry sheep is never the solution. Go offend for yourselves. No. You see, the disciples needed to learn to reflect the compassion of Christ. As they looked out at the starving crowds that were like sheep without a shepherd, unable to find food for themselves, Jesus said, you cannot be any different. You cannot be callous. You cannot say, well, it's none of my business. No, you need to have hearts, hearts that are broken over the needs of the crowd, that, like mine, are yearn after their welfare. Well, my friends, this is the beginning. This is the beginning of Christian ministry and service of any kind. The truth is, we will be useless in the spiritual wasteland of this world until we begin to see people the way Christ sees them. Until our hearts, as we look at a world that is dying in sin, until our hearts begin to bleed as Christ's heart bled over people that are listening to the damning lies of sin, who are rushing away from God, enslaved to their sin, enslaved to so many lies. Christian ministry begins at the point where we lose the apathy that looks out at spiritually needy people and says, well, it's too bad. I mean, I, I wish them the best, but, well, after all, what can I do about it? No, we need to start 
by saying, God, give us the heart of Christ. As we look out at a world who's so full of misery, we would say, Christ, give me your heart. Give me your heart that reflects the compassion of my Savior, because this is the driving force behind any kind of Christian ministry. The truth is, this lesson needed to be combined with a second lesson. And that was that the disciples needed to learn to rely on Christ's power to feed the flock. Look at verse 37. He answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? You see, Christ says, No, you can't send them away. You have to do something about it. And the response of the disciples is to look at themselves, to look at the own, their own natural resources, and they're incredulous. They said, what do you mean you feed them? We're not able to meet the needs of this crowd. We don't have the resources to, to supply such need. And in response, Christ says, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. See, in essence, Christ says, okay, you don't have the resources, I understand that. What do you have? Start with what you have and bring that little to me and let me multiply it. And my friends, this is the very heart of the lesson that Christ was teaching his disciples. It is the lesson of dependence. You don't have the resources in yourself. But if you will bring the little that you do have to me, I can use it to feed a multitude. You see, the disciples needed to learn to reflect the compassion of Christ, but that needed to be paired together with a sense of their own emptiness, their own inability in themselves to meet the needs. They needed to learn to rely completely, utterly, totally upon Christ. And so in the end, we have this beautiful picture of the Good Shepherd breaking the bread and passing it to his disciples and his disciples setting it before the hungry multitudes. And my friends, that is the picture of Christian ministry. Whether it be pastoral ministry, whether it be your ministry to your children, whether it be evangelism, whether it be you ministering to a fellow Christian in church, that is the picture of Christian ministry. We see spiritual need. We're propelled by hearts of compassion, and we come to Christ and we say, Lord, look at the people. Look at their needs, but I have nothing to set before them. In myself, I'm empty. And Christ says, okay, give me what you have, and we offer what we have to him, and he breaks it. And we become broken. We enter into the self-denial, the death to self, by which the life of Christ can begin to flow through us. At the end of the day, we find we're not actually setting ourselves before anyone. We find that Christ is actually using us to set him before them. We are declaring the good shepherd. We, we proclaim his broken body, and we proclaim that he is sufficient to save and to sanctify and to heal and to comfort and to satisfy. I said earlier that we'll be useless in any kind of Christian service until we begin to feel something of Christ's compassion. But it is equally true that we will be useless until we become convinced that in ourselves we have nothing to offer spiritually starving humanity. We must come to the point where we realize that human effort separated from Christ is useless to meet the deepest needs of mankind so that we offer ourselves to Christ. At the end of the day, we set him in all of his glory of sufficiency before a world that is dying. As we look out at a world that is lost and dying in sin, filled with deceptive philosophy, false teaching, false religion, as we look out at men and women who are spiritually scattered like sheep without a shepherd, May God give us grace to learn the lessons of this passage. Christ is the good shepherd who has laid down his life for the sheep. Christ is the bread of life who can feed hungry souls. And may we remember that as his disciples, we are an army of lambs.
We go forth in complete dependence upon him, yes, reflecting something of his compassion, but ultimately taking him and setting him before a world that is without hope and without God. May God give us grace to follow in the footsteps of our Savior more and more. Amen. Let us pray. Glorious God in heaven, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for his, his glory. We thank you for his person. We thank you for his mission. Gracious God, we recognize that the people of this world who do not know Christ are spiritually blind to him. We can gather in this chapel. We can hear of the excellencies and the glory and the saving worth of Christ. And we can be moved and stirred. And yet when we go out into this world, Lord, we recognize people are blinded. They're distracted by temporary pleasures and addictions and sins of various kinds. And so, Lord, we come to you and we recognize and we plead with you that you would strengthen us, that you would remind us, O oh Lord, that in ourselves we have nothing. And we pray that you would strengthen and equip us, that we might be your people in this earth, showing forth the glory of Christ to a world that is lost in sin. Glorify yourself in us, O oh Lord. May your kingdom come. And may your will be done. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.